50 million buffalo disappeared from the American West, and modern ranching has taken its place. So was this a government conspiracy to starve the Indians, or was it just business? This man made over $300,000 in one season killing buffalo. But Colonel Sheridan wrote that the government should kill all the buffalo to take care of the Indian problem. So which one is true? Join myself and my past self today as we discover the truth of what happened to the buffalo and how modern ranching took its place. Two hundred years ago, this is exactly what someone would have seen coming to the prairie. Originally, there was somewhere between 15 and 60 million buffalo on the plains. That's a lot. So when, when you come out here, this is on the American Prairie Reserve. You can see one right out there. There's two down here. It's incredible to step back in time right here. I'm stepping back in time and actually seeing what they would have seen from a horse, just like they would have seen it 200 years ago. The big old buffalo scrape there. Down here, they're making this into a preserve so that's like it was 200 years ago. And right over there is cattle. It's always interesting to see the clash of the two worlds. Nothing, nothing goes smoothly when you clash two worlds together. You can see that throughout history. We're gonna go back and cook some breakfast at the camp. So what happened to all the buffalo? The story is that the government wanted the buffalo gone to starve out the Indians and prepare this country for settlement. So the first thing we have to do is ask ourselves, is this, we like to blame the government. So is this just somebody blaming the government or was there actual documentation? Did they did they have a conspiracy to get rid of the buffalo? So first we have to look at what is a conspiracy? What, what does that mean? Well, according to Google, it means a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. So that means that we have to see, did the government intentionally, secretly behind closed doors, come up with this plan and then implement it somehow to get rid of the buffalo for their own purposes? So the first thing I think I need to discover for myself is how much impact did the hide hunters have? What were they doing and how much impact did it? Because didn't, if they didn't have a huge impact, then we can look at like the army and how much they were killing and target practicing because they were. So one of the things I found very interesting to start with is what happened in 1871. This is an excerpt from a book back in 2008 and it's talking about the tanning industry. Now I found an article before this that talks about the, the first buffalo hides that came to England and how they couldn't figure out how to make them supple or usable. They're, they were so tough and hard and large and thick that they couldn't figure out how to do anything with them. Well in 1870 or 1871, tanners in England and Germany figured out a process that made tanning hides, meaning making them usable as leather for products cheap and easy to do and reproduce. I think this is very important to the storyline of where the what happened to the buffalo because you couldn't use the hides for very much until after this process was developed. Now the Indians on the plains had a process and they could tan them and for many many years before this the British had established forts in Canada and were actually trading especially with the Blackfoot Indians here in Montana for hides that were already tanned because they didn't have a process to tan these things. Well, then when that all changed in 1870 or 1871, when this cheap process that they came up with to tan hides to make them usable for products, 
The products that I could find that they used them for were industrial belts for machinery. Like we use rubber belts, but rubber really wasn't used for a whole lot of the industrial world until later on in the 1800s and early 1900s. So they were using leather for that. They were using um, tanned buffalo hides for that. And the soles of boots, which they needed for, especially for armies. They needed something that would wear, because they didn't have rubber, they needed something that would wear longer. So buffalo hide was tougher and thicker than cow hide, so they used it for that. So because of these products, there was an instant demand for buffalo hides in Europe. And that led us to the, to the second part. So let's look at what happened on the plains because of this development. I found a newspaper article from 1880. A buffalo hide was worth somewhere between a dollar and a dollar seventy-five a hide, it, it, according to this article. There were anywhere from 3,000 to 6,000 hunters, buffalo hunters, in the season of 1876 in the panhandle of Texas. It was supposed to be set aside for Indians, but because of this, everybody moved in there. Let's say 4,000 or 4,500 hunters moved onto the plains because of this to make their fortune with this. There was a group of them for each group. It, it talks about that the a, a buffalo hunter group was one or two hunters, and then you had two skinners and then a cook. The cook was there to stake the hides out, to, to get them to dry, and to keep take care of camp. The hunters would go out early in the morning and kill a buffalo. The skinners would follow them out with a wagon, skin them and pile the hides in a wagon and bring them to camp. A poor hunt was considered a thousand hides in a season at in 1876. So when they first moved out there, there were buffalo everywhere. So the hunting was easy. And a, a decent hunt, like any good hunter, was expected to come in with at least 2,000. If we do the calculations on that, even at a thousand hides per hunter, if there was 4,000 hunters, that's 4 million hides, 4 million buffalo killed, just in one season in the panhandle of Texas. And then three seasons later in 1877, it talks about the total hides shipped was 5,000. So you went from <laughs> each hunter group killing over 2,000 buffalo or 1,000 to 2,000 buffalo or even higher, because one guy, even, it even says he made over $8,000 in one season. That'd be like $300,000 in today's money. When you went from that to all the... All the hunters combined only coming up with 5,000 hides in an entire season. You can see the devastation that this wrought right there, uh, written on the page from that date, from 1880. So we're, we're looking right at the time period when they all disappeared. When I see how much impact these hide hunters had on the numbers of buffalo, it's no wonder that they were gone in such a short time. So does this really have to do with the government conspiracy or is it something else? And how does this lead into ranching? How did ranching take the place of this or was it a part of the conspiracy? I think it was a consequence of capitalism, the demand for buffalo hides in a world where there's finite resources like buffalo, when re buffalo is not a, an infinite resource, you have to consider that sometimes the government has to come in and regulate that so that there maintains, so that there remains some of the supply that you're actually dealing with. They were down to actually 300 animals, and that's when they all of a sudden a few private people actually began to um, capture and maintain these herds to preserve them f for the future. Because they, they thought, man, we're gonna. We're gonna make these things extinct. And they would have, could have easily done that with 300 left. It was a man named Charlie Goodnight who actually instigated this. And he was, he saw the demise of the buffalo and he wanted to keep some of these from dying. So he started raising them on his ranch as pets. And as it actually, he experimented with them in crossbreeding them with cattle to find a, he was convinced a tougher cow a, a better beef cow that would actually last on the range during the winter so they didn't have to feed hay. So that was part of what he was doing. But because of this, he was actually able to save 
a lot of buffalo and, and some buffalo came from his property to stock some of the other locations around the country for national parks and things. Uh, and he even has a little picture or drawing of his, his ranch in at this period in 1892. Now there's thousands of, uh, thousands of buffalo in the west again because you have Yellowstone Park you've got and you got a lot of private people that are raising buffalo now. And now here we have the American Prairie Reserve. So then the buffalo were all gone, which left a vacuum out here in the west. And that's when cattle started moving in. Yeah, so all the wealthy people over in Europe, they were wanting to invest in something. It was a bubble. It was just like the tulip bubble or the dot-com bubble. It was a huge bubble. Everybody threw their money into cattle and put them out here in the west, which flooded the market with cattle at that time, dropped the price, and then they had a disaster. They had an absolute disaster in 1886 that totally changed the landscape of the West again. Just got to get my second cup rolling. Head down the road a little bit. So this trailer that steering gave me, it's got room up here for one horse with a saddle on. You see that fits just, just right. And he's a big horse, so he's a big horse. He fits in there just fine with a saddle. And then this area back here is just all open for cattle or other horses or whatever. Special thanks to Steer and Trailer Sales in Three Forks, Montana for letting me use this trailer for this trip. And if you want this particular trailer, this is a cowboy tack. It's got a huge tack room. It's 24 feet long. You can get $500 off this trailer if you mention that you saw it from Trinity. So go to Sterian.com and check out all their trailers. You won't regret it. Let's see if I can go find some more buffalo to finish the story of the West here. Buffalo bull land right there. He's a big old boy and doesn't really care if I'm here either. <laughs> Pretty amazing. So when the buffalo disappeared out of the west, I was saying that they came out here with cattle. And they came out with cattle, but no signs. So nobody knew about overgrazing what that caused. So all the cattle came out here from Texas. So the, the, the big shots, the money guys from Europe and even Teddy Roosevelt invested a bunch of money over in South Dakota. And all of this was open range. So basically nobody owned the land. You just kind of chose a spot and ran your cattle there. And you would kind of mix your cattle with everybody else's. So you just run them on whatever ground you thought possible so they stocked it with as many cattle as they possibly could thinking money is in the numbers right well the problem is is over time what that did was it caused a, a lot of overgrazing because you had a ton of cattle on more more cattle than the land could sustain and nobody fed hay in those days you just let them run in the winter time all winter long and then in the spring you'd have a roundup and you'd round up all the cows you could find and you'd sort out the ones that were yours and, and sort out your neighbors and all that. And everybody would kind of get together and sort out the ones that were theirs. And then you would do your branding. You brand all the calves that you found and you turn them back loose again. So that was how they raised cattle in the West. And that worked until you overgrazed everything for so long. And then you had a little bit of a culmination of factors that contributed to the disaster of 1886. And that was that in 1886 or five, I can't remember which one, the government uh, set aside most 
of Colorado as an Indian reservation. So they were gonna move all the cattle off of that range. And it was huge. It was like most of the state of Colorado. So they had to, all the cowboys moved all the, all, all the cattle, thousands and thousands of head of cattle off of that range in Colorado up to Wyoming and Montana. And which was already overstocked. So when in the year of, in the winter of 1886, was one of the worst winters ever recorded. It had wind chills and temperatures of 65 below and all winter long was so horrible. Well, all the overstocked ground had nothing to eat. So these cattle that could, used to be able to winter there starved. I mean like starved. The stories about the drifts were so high that, that in the springtime they found cattle hanging in trees, like in the tops of trees, because they would go up to the tops of these drifts and they were eating the bark off the trees to try to get something to eat. And they would literally die in the in the trees. So in the springtime, you'd go along and there'd be cattle hanging in the trees. There was so many cattle dead in the rivers because they would go on the rivers and it would the ice would break and they'd fall in. So many cattle died in the rivers. One guy lost 6,000 head of cattle just in the rivers alone. That they, in the spring, they caused dams. Like the dead cattle would actually cause dams across the river and back the river up. That's how many dead cattle there were in that year. So that changed the face of the West yet again because everybody at that point knew because so many fortunes were lost. That was the the, the pop of the bubble. The, the price of cattle had already gone down significantly because there was so many cattle on the market that, that what, what that did is it enabled it kind of, when, when the market is down, ranchers kept their cattle waiting for the price to come back up. So when they did that, obviously that, that caused even more issues because it would cause more of a stocking. But, almost half of the cattle in the entire West died in that one winter. So what did they change after that that drastically cha changed the face of the West? Well, we'll talk about that next. So I got this group of buffalo behind me here. There's a lot of them, cows and calves. And we're downwind, so they can't really get a whiff of us, but they can see that it's an animal, so they're not really going anywhere. So what happened after, after the winter of 1886, when all the cattle died, is that people decided, they understood then that they needed to ranch in a different way. and wallow. Come on, get over there. There you go, come on. There you go. Rather than just go open range and uh, leave, leave your cattle out all winter, they knew that they needed to have a way to feed their cattle in the in the winter time. So, what they did was they sectioned areas off into ranches, started fencing off different areas, and then putting up hay in the summertime so they could feed it in the winter time. And that's really when the modern day ranching really began. The day of the cowboy, the, the roundup cowboy and all that kind of went by the wayside at that point. And we got to where we are now where, you know, people manage their grazing very, very carefully. Oh, they're gonna come over and take a look. <laughs> I'm not gonna let them get too close here, but. They're, some of them are curious. They're coming over to take a look and see what what Calabar is here. They're not really used to to um, horses, I'm sure. See that? They're going to come right over to me. They're like, well, it's an animal. But when they get to those bushes, I'm turning around and leaving because those suckers can get nasty when they get close. So. I would assume they'd stop right there anyway. <laughs> they're, 
they're getting a little close for me. Hey girl, that's close enough. I don't really want to get my horse stuck in the gut or something. So we'll leave her behind. <laughs> They're all curious. Oh, they're gonna follow me, I suppose. You can see how hard it was, or how easy it was, to kill a whole bunch of buffalo back in the day. They would actually shoot, the buffalo hunters would pick out the leader. They would attempt to, to discover which one was the leader, and they would shoot that one. And what that would do is bring the herd to a stand, what they call the stand, where they would kind of mill around the leader for a long, long time. Enough times that sometimes they could kill 100 to 300 buffalo in that one stand. So they would shoot that leader first, and then they could just sit there in one spot and kill tons and tons of buffalo. So that's another contributor to the demise of the buffalo is how easy it was to kill large numbers of them. So supposedly a guy named Smits wrote an article about Colonel Sheridan out on the plains and he wrote an article and he really talked about a lot even before Congress supposedly about taking out the buffalo to starve the Indians. That they should applaud the hide hunters instead of limit or regulate the hide hunting. But there was people just as fervent on the other side standing up for the buffalo all over the place. In fact, a hunter by the name of Hornaday, he speaks very vehemently uh, against the this, this slaughter. Hornaday was actually tasked with going to kill some of the very last buffalo to save them as specimens in the museums in Washington, D.C. and New York because they thought this this was the last ones. These were the last buffalo. They Back then, you couldn't fly over the whole country, so you didn't know that there was actually a pocket of buffalo still alive over here in the Paradise Valley uh, down southern, uh, southwest Montana. They didn't know that. They, they had to, you know, look around for these buffalo. He actually thought this was kind of the last ones that he found, and uh, he was tasked with doing that. And he, his... If you read this article in this newspaper, he is just he's just horrified at the destruction and the disappearance of the buffalo. And he blames the buffalo hunters and the cowboys. So what do we get from this? I know that controlling and eliminating the buffalo population did subdue the Indian population because you, you took away their supply. You, you, no army, as Sheridan put it, no army can stand when their supply train is taken out. There was factions of government fighting on both sides to regulate against the killing of all the buffalo and to allow it to happen. But what, because of that, the two sides, I think what happened is, is nothing happened. They just were in gridlock over that issue. And so you could say that there was a conspiracy in a way. I don't know about a conspiracy. You could say that it happened. The government allowed it to happen to subdue the Indian territory to make a nation out here in the West. That brings up a lot of moral issues that we you, there's no good answer to, right? There's not a lot of good answers to these issues as we discuss the demise of the Indians and the displacement of them to the reservations and the ongoing thing with with all of that in our country. But speaking of the buffalo, I think it was a thought process of a few people in government and in the army. And what happened was is they were able to at least cause enough indifference or gridlock for there not to be any regulation to stop the killing of buffalo. So the inevitable happened. And I wouldn't say it's a conspiracy that the government did it on purpose but they did allow it to happen. So you could, in a way, say that it was the government who did that, but not quite as directly as I think some people think. They're a little bit, they're kind of wondering what I am. <laughs> like, what is he doing over there? Yeah. 
So anyway, that's what the modern type, how the modern ranch was born, was through that process of the buff, buffalo being eliminated from the prairie, and then open range, and the death of all the cattle during the winter of 1886, developed into the modern ranching that we have now. Now, agriculture is super important to the economy and the livelihood of the West, and it also protects land from being from development. It, it creates places for wildlife to thrive on in agriculture. And, and we need to acknowledge that we, the ranchers out West are producing the food that we eat. They're producing the food that we eat and the nation eats and the, and the world eats. A lot of the issues I'm gonna be talking about over the next several weeks are those issues. Like how do we save ranchers? Why would you wanna save ranchers? And, and what are some ways that we could do that so that we can preserve this land? Now, American Prairie Reserve is preserving a lot of land as well, but we can't all we can't have 100% preserve because then we'll lose our food source. So you have to. The real question and battle going on in the West right now is over the land. How do we utilize the land and preserve it for future generations so we can produce food for the future? And that's something we have to consider because down the road, when it's all in development or we've lost too much of it and then we can't sustain or feed the country, that's a problem. So, and I don't believe in government subsidies or price fixing or anything like that as the, as the solution. Because every time you do, every time that kind of gets involved and you kind of force the market to be a certain way, somebody else always pays for it. It, it it never works out down the road so so that's it for today i hope you've enjoyed this investigation into what happened to the buffalo and how ranching got to where it is today i'll be delving into these issues and more and continuing to have adventures with calabar out on the prairies and mountains of montana please join me i'll see you next time god bless